Dr. Maria Espinola, I am a clinical psychologist and for the past few weeks I have been working with a group of friends and colleagues on a series of videos focused on race and the Black Lives Matter movement. For today's video I invited Dr. Keith Thompson to discuss racial trauma. Dr. Thompson is a clinical community psychologist and assistant professor at Fordham University. He completed his undergraduate studies at Morehouse College, where he became the recipient of the Oprah Winfrey Scholarship. It's the men from the house! After graduating from Morehouse College, he earned a PhD in clinical community psychology at the University of South Carolina. Dr. Thompson and I became friends while studying at the Center for Multicultural Training in Psychology at Boston University Medical Center. We both then stayed in Boston and completed postdoctoral fellowships at Harvard Medical School. During the past seven years, we have had many professional and personal conversations on race, but this is the first time we will share our conversation online for everyone to hear. Today, Dr. Thompson will speak about racial trauma. He will also share some of his personal experiences as a black man in America, and he will offer some advice for people who want to support the Black Lives Matter movement. How do you define racial trauma? I turn on the news and point at the screen because that's what's going on. That's how I define it. When I see the same callousness and the same lack of empathy from people in power directed at black people that could have just as easily happened 40 days or 400 years ago, that's racial trauma. When I see Latinx children in cages along the border, separated from their families and in pain, that's racial trauma. I have Asian students Asian students to experience racism from other New Yorkers as this pandemic was heating up, getting harassed and avoided on the subway, they were experiencing racial trauma. Every racial minority has a specific flavor of racial trauma that they experience when they come to this country, and none of those flavors are new. We have movies, books, and other media that have illustrated that for us all since we were young. So when we see it, we just categorize it appropriately and add it to the pile. Obviously, it's an upsetting experience to have even a minimum level of racial identity means that you acknowledge and you empathize with people who look just like you who are dealing with incredibly unfair situations and outcomes and to know that the system that we all have bought into and paid taxes to support is part of those horrendous outcomes is even insult to injury. Um, my mom did a really good job exposing me to racial injustice when I was young without making me scared about it. Um, I remember watching the Rodney King tapes and I remember the unrest in Los Angeles that occurred as a result. I remember um, some of my middle school teachers were really upset when O.J. Simpson was acquitted. Later that day, a black man named Antoine Cedric was found hanging in an underserved neighborhood in my hometown of Hampton, Virginia. The police called it a suicide, but the black community viewed it then and probably still views it now as retribution for O.J. Simpson's acquittal. HBO did a documentary on it that premiered a few years later, but it's not available anymore. So, I mean, I received my PhD from the University of South Carolina the same day that Michael Brown was shot dead by police officers in Ferguson, Missouri. It wasn't lost on me that day how blessed I was that my path culminated in a terminal degree when other people who look just like me get bullets. A couple months later, I remember being at Harvard Medical School for my postdoctoral fellowship, like literally at the top of the ivory tower while the Black Lives Matter movement raged over the injustice of his murderer not being indicted by the St. Louis grand jury. None of my peers there seemed to care. Like, it was just a Tuesday morning to them. Meanwhile, I felt like an interloper. I didn't feel like I belonged there, and not because I wasn't competent, 
but because I was only helping myself by being there. Like I felt guilty for not doing enough for my people who so clearly needed champions. All this education I've accumulated will not mean much if I do not find a way to use it to elevate them. And I'm still working on what that method will be. I think it's important to encourage people to vote. Honestly, I mean, any any platform that I have nowadays, I'm using it to talk about um, the power of the vote. It's really important that people do their own research on the platforms of those individuals who are running for local and state and national office so that they can make informed choices um, in their primaries and in the election and then in November that they go vote. I think it's important to say that. Um, I think it's important to, you know, with the pandemic happening at the same time as the uprising, I think it's important to remind people that, you know, protesting is important and I'm a very huge fan of it. And yet, if you choose to protest to be safe and not just safe from the pandemic with like, you know, wearing a mask and hand sanitizer and, you know, um, not being in crowds where people are not wearing masks, but also safe from the police. Because unfortunately, um, as we can see in the events of Louisville, Kentucky and Minneapolis, Minnesota, they will not always be on our side even when the cameras are rolling. So doing what we can to, um, to neutralize those threats, if it means, you know, wearing gas masks, if it means, you know, carrying around, you know, spray bottles with milk and magnesia and water so that, you know, tear gassing is not so much of a threat. Like when our clients come meet with us and they are, you know, talking about their experiences with protesting, I think that we could provide them a very important opportunity to kind of strategize how to do that given their own unique circumstances. And, and so I think that we need to take advantage of, of our time with clients, not forcing it on them. You know, I mean, if they come in wanting to talk about, you know, school or relationships or whatever's going on in their world, you know, giving them their the full attention directed towards that. But if they talk about, okay, I want to protest or, you know, so-and-so in my family is protesting or so-and-so in my family, you know, is against me politically, you know, making time and really devoting yourself on how you can help them solve those problems. Because I think that those particular problems, we are at a, uh, point of no return and people will remember who was helping them solve those problems and who kind of just turned a blind eye or who minimized them and I know I don't want to be somebody that anybody thinks minimized that kind of problem in today's in today's world so that I think is important we um, not just as psychologists but we as citizens in this in this global society will not forget that this happened and that we will all do what we can to carry that torch mm -hmm. um, and you know knowing that the pandemic is probably not going to be over for a while starting to shift how we think about reaching out to others um you know i know like within the education world i've been teaching online since march and I'm teaching graduate school students. So I know that most of them have, you know, the technology and the Wi-Fi that they need. But I also think about the elementary and the middle school and the high school students that are going to be starting class in the fall who may not have that technology and may not have that Wi-Fi. And I worry and I wonder how the school systems are gonna meet that need, you know, particularly those school systems that have not already given their students laptops, you know? And I worry and I wonder about, you know, children who are dealing with food insecurity, housing insecurity, um, witnessing their parents, you know, argue, fight, debate, not even debate, but like abuse. Um, 
children who may have been abused themselves over these past couple months and, and what that will do for their ability to hit the ground running in the fall, whatever grade they're starting. And so I, I think, I, I really hope that, you know, people watching this video, people watching your other interviews who are psychologically minded, who are upwardly mobile, who mm -hmm. want to find ways to make a change in this world for the better. I hope that this community that you are creating will not forget who it is that we cannot see and who does not have resources to kind of keep up with these quickly changing times because it's really important that we reach out to those underserved communities and make sure that they are evolving along with the rest of us.